Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Validated, the Science of Sterile Processing Efficiency Virtual Conference. I'm Bobby Parker from Beyond Clean. I would like to take just a moment and thank you personally for joining us today. It has been an awesome day of just explosive educational content. We've heard from some dynamic speakers today and uh, saved a great topic list for last. Uh, Jeff Berger here is the Principal of Engineering and Operations at Del Dorado. He has extensive e experience in both leadership and operational experience through work with Fortune 500 companies, healthcare systems, and startups. Jeff enjoys pushing the frontier of industry knowledge by learning from others and sharing his perspective. He currently works, serves on several industry councils and technical committees and is a frequent speaker at universities and national conferences. So as we get started today, have you ever had hard work and good intentions result in some unexpected and poor outcomes? Have you made performance improvements that turned out to make performance outcomes somehow worse? During this presentation, Jeff's gonna outline the basic principles that govern outcomes so that you can be better prepared to recognize how to change and how change can affect a system, particularly in sterile processing and surgical services. So get ready to discover the laws of lean and how it can improve your SPD. Join me in welcoming Jeff. All right, thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. I uh, want to thank uh, Beyond Clean CCI and OneTray for sponsoring this. Uh, a very exciting day so far, a lot of good education, and uh, I'm proud to be part of it. So I'm coming to you from beautiful Naples and uh, just a little bit about me is on the railroad uh, in healthcare and now I'm in aquatics. And uh, you know, you might wonder how they're connected. If it was just tool-based, you know, they're all very different. So the same ones don't apply across different industries. What it really is is principles. So what we're gonna talk today is about principles and how they can apply to SPD. All right. So just a couple things, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, just please ask. Uh, we'll try and address them right away. And if you wanna know more about a certain topic, just, uh, you know, you can ask at the end and uh, we're gonna be here for, uh, excuse me, uh, for some follow-up and Q&A. And, &A. and uh, feel free to share any content uh, during the presentation. All right, so a lot of people have heard about lean. You can't wait a little pull. What does lean mean to you? Is it principles and systems, processes, flow, eliminating waste, tools, or nothing? Never heard of it. If you could, please take a minute and make your selection. I see one so far, nothing, never heard of it. I think we have a couple people out there, see if we get any more answers in. All right, coming in. A couple never heard of it, some principles. So pretty good mix there. All right, we're gonna go to results. All right, principles, 27%. Yeah, yeah, I may have influenced that a little bit. We have eliminating waste with 27.3, tools with nine, and nothing, never heard of it, 39.4. You've never heard of it, that's okay, because uh, it's relatively, uh, I don't wanna say new to healthcare, but it's uh, pretty getting pretty widespread, but it's come, come from uh, the automotive industry and, and through industry, or through uh, other uh, heavy industries. So first we'll start, what is lean? So lean means a lot of things to many people. Uh, it came from, uh, or is widely attributed to the Toyota production system. But really that's been the result of a, a lot of experimentation and development over a long, long time. Going back to scientific management, uh, development of engineering principles, management principles, economic principles, and uh, other things. But the common thread is it comes down to principles but there's a lot of misunderstanding about principles. And, uh, you know, I've studied principles for a long time. By no means am I the ultimate expert on it, 
but I, I've got a pretty good grasp, and that's why I'd like to share with you today what I know about it. So before we get into the discussion of principles, I'd like to discuss gravity. You may have seen in the title we said the law of gravity. So uh, what's that have to do with SPD? Well, maybe nothing directly other than it affects SPD, in healthcare, automotive industry, everything equally. So where do you fall in the debate of gravity? Do you think gravity exists? You drop a ball off a skyscraper, it falls to the ground. It exists, but you don't necessarily think it governs what will happen. You don't know anything about gravity, but you know the ball will fall. Or you think gravity does not exist at all. So if you would, just take a quick uh, click and select which one of those of the poll uh, you think it is. All right, got some answers coming in. Give it about 10 more seconds. At the end of the day, so I don't want to linger too, too long. We can uh, get the answers in and move along. All right, so here's the results. Gravity exists. If you drop it off the skyscraper, it falls to the ground. It exists, but it doesn't mean it will fall. Don't know anything about gravity, but I know it will fall, and gravity does not exist. So we may have an astronaut tuning in who's number four, but gravity does exist even in space. This might not seem like it. So what's that have to do with anything? So gravity is a principle. So what the, the key characteristics of a principle, a principle is absolutely universal and it applies to everyone everywhere. It doesn't apply in certain situations. It doesn't apply to some people and not to others. It doesn't apply you know, in one industry and not another. The second most important characteristic of a principle is that it governs outcomes. It's not in, inconsequential. If gravity existed and if the ball didn't fall, it might be a principle, but if it doesn't have any effect on outcomes, then it's not a principle. So a key to, or, uh, thing to distinguish is principles are not values. So values are personal and subjective, and they govern individuals. They're normally formed early in life, and they're not universal. My values may be different than yours. Uh, my values are different than my wife's values in certain ways, different than my coworkers. Different industries have different values than other people. So it's really important to know the difference. We won't get too far into values. They're, they're extremely important, but they are very different than principles. So not being aware of or understanding principles can and does cause hard work and good intentions to result in poor outcomes. Here's where you see the good intentions of hard work, improvement, changes, sometimes not end up the way you expect them to end up. So, you know, what, what could we have missed when it comes to principles? All right, so that key one we first said, a principle is universal, applies to everyone everywhere. So think about that. Gravity is a principle. It applies to automotive plant workers, SPD techs, patients, athletes, politicians, CEOs, babies. I could have kept the list going. It applies literally to everyone in factories, hospitals, water parks, rail yards, airports, cruise ships. Again, could have kept on going. It applies everywhere. There's not a place that it doesn't exist. We have, may have some theoretical physicists out there that may argue, but... Um, you know, that's for a different discussion, a different day. But for all intents and purposes, they apply to everyone and everywhere. So what's that have to do with lean and SPD? So lean principles also apply to everyone, everywhere. Doesn't matter if you're aware of it or not, they apply. And that's the beauty of them, that they apply to different industries, they apply to different people, the same way equally. So question, and this is uh, more of a rhetorical question, but uh, you, uh, you hear about lean principles, scientific principles. So if principles are universal, should they be called lean principles or just principles? And uh, that's one thing that's uh, you know, kind of, I don't know, fun to argue about if you're someone like me is, is, are they lean principles? Are they universal to lean or only apply to lean? If they are, they're probably not a principle. So as we go through these, there's 12 principles. And I know it sounds like a lot, but we'll try to move through them pretty quickly. But uh, I want you to think about how they apply to you, your work situation, 
uh, your personal life, anything like that. So the second part is they govern outcomes. If a principle you know, has no consequence, like we said earlier, then it's not a principle. It has to have some kind of effect, some kind of meaning. So gravity governs the outcome. The ball will fall. We saw in the poll some said gravity exists, but the ball may not fall. And sure, you know there, there may be something. It may be a drone ball. It's got a propeller. Still, gravity is affecting the ball. But uh, it will not fall, I guess, if it's got that. But. So the ball will fall. So SPD tech drops a, uh, it in the hospital atrium, it'll fall. Or a hospital in, uh, worker drops, I'm sorry, an automotive drops a wrench off a platform, or a surgeon drops an instrument in the OR. Is it gonna fall? Definitely is. Panel fall right there. It's working right here in my little studio. So not only is gravity universal, but it also governs outcomes for everyone everywhere, predictably, equally. It affects everybody the same way. So again, going on, thinking about these principles, just like gravity, each and every lean principle governs consequences. So the other part was not being aware of, or understanding principles can and does result in poor outcomes. So it's easy to be aware of gravity and understand it. However, most principles are much less clear. So you've, you've uh, well, maybe not you, but if you've ever been pulled over for speeding, something like that. Uh, you say, well, I don't know. I didn't see the speed limit. Doesn't matter. You're still governed by that law. The same thing with these lean principles. You may not know about them, but they're still affecting outcomes all over the place. So with that little background on principles, we'll get into the 12 lean principles. So there's three dimensions to the lean principles. We'll try and compartmentalize them, make them a little easier to understand how they affect the people and the work that we do. So they fall into alignment principles that governs how groups of people become better united or conversely more divided to achieve goals. Enabling principles, and they govern psychological safety. Uh, and when you see you know, these being used in the right way, you see transparency and accountability. When you don't, you see the opposite and improvement principles. That's what you traditionally think of with lean. That's where most of the tools that we use uh, reside or in the improvement principle arena. But all three of those dimensions are equally important. So the alignment principles, there's three of them. Constancy of purpose, create value for the customer, and think systemically. So constancy of purpose. So does everyone understand why they exist? Maybe not you as a person, but as an organization, as a business unit, as a department. What are you there to do? Does everybody understand what the ultimate goal is? What is your purpose? You may have heard, what's your why? Why do you do what you do? Why are we here? So is there a commitment to shared understanding of why you exist? You know, if that's maintained over time, does it change? If it's changing constantly, you're gonna have uh, bad outcomes because you don't really understand the reason you're there doing what you're doing. So why am I giving this presentation? It's because I really wanna share the principles. That's my purpose for this. If I, if I get off topic, you're gonna to be confused, not understand the message I'm trying to get. I'll fail in my, in my uh, mission to help educate. So if I don't maintain constancy of purpose, then uh, it'll have Poor, poor outcomes. All right, create value for the customer. So this is where whatever you're doing is creating value for the customer, not creating waste. Okay, so you want to know who are your customers? Traditionally think of patients, surgeons. What about your coworkers? What about different departments along the way? What about decontamination? Uh, the back table, their customers decontamination in some ways. Uh, the assembly, can, they can be a customer of decontamination. Uh, people listening to the presentation are a customer of me right now in this time. If I'm wasting your time, then I'm not creating value for you. So really, 
it's trying to trying to do what's creating most value for the or most value for that customer. So what do our customers want and how can you find out? So again, just think of the, the traditional customers, the patient or the surgeon. Those are pretty clear. But you also think about the organization. Uh, they want it to keep costs down, keep quality high. Think about your internal customers, the people doing the delivery to the OR. Again, assembly, going back up the line, decon, the back table. Each one is a customer along that line of the process. And it converts it down the other way, each one's a provider. If everyone creates value in that chain, each customer along the way is going to be, be getting what they need and what they want. And then also th think about yourself. To whom are you a customer? And what do you need? Uh, a lot of people assume that the, the people providing them, when they're the customer, know what they want. But it's, very, it's important to be clear and transparent so that people providing you services know what, what you need. And think systemically. So principles should be like your children. They're supposed to love them equally. But this is my favorite one because it unites everything. Everything is a system, is interconnected, it's interdependent. It's impossible to understand how every system works exactly because there's forces that are unknown to everybody within them. But uh, what, what you really want to do is think about how each action or each change affects everyone else. I'm not sure if everyone saw the, the test with the Tesla truck where they threw a ball at the window and the window shattered. And everyone was shocked. They did it on stage. So how'd that happen? They tested the panels and all the panels stood up to all the tests. They tested the windows. They stood up to the test. The frame was tested. The seats were tested. Every component on that vehicle was tested. They didn't test it when it was all put together. Turns out the different frequencies and the, and the metals when it was hit made the window shatter. So even though that window passed that test in every way in isolation, when it became part of a system, it failed. So you want to kind of think about that when you're optimizing different parts of a system. How's it affecting other places? It almost requires certain parts of that system to be sub-optimized because if they're running at full bore, then you're going to negatively affect other parts of the system and actually uh, you know, take down the, the uh, productivity of the system overall. Have you ever been pushing so hard, maybe in decontam, that now assembly is just piled high, so high that they can't do their work? Or you see uh, all kind of trays stacked up right in front of the sterilizer, so the sterilizer then gets backed up. If you do it in a nice, even uh, pace, where each place is optimized for the system instead of for its own compartment, it'll help the system uh, perform better overall. Now we'll go to the enabling principles. So the enabling principles govern psychological safety and transparency and uh, accountability. So the three with that are lead with humility, respect every individual, and learn continuously. So lead with humility. So that's the opposite of a command and control, but you're communicating and coaching. It's, it's recognizing that the most tangible customer value is often created at the front line. Instead of the most power and the most uh, authority at the top, down at the front where people are interacting with the customers. Again, think of even internal customers. It does, it's not the uh, external customers all the time. The value created along that chain is, is where you really need to, to focus on. So if you look at that, are humble enough to learn and figure out how to support it, that's uh, really the embodiment of leading with humility. So it's not about job title or education or experience. Each individual in that chain is important. And that's, that's another part of the leading with humility, is recognizing that everybody contributes to the value that you're creating. The second enabling principle is respect every individual. So this is, a, this is one that we hear a lot when people talk about lean. So don't confuse it with just being nice. It's not being pleasant and uh, you know, treating everybody in a traditionally nice way. It's recognizing people as individuals, uh, recognizing their individual talents, backgrounds, perspectives, feelings, and how they can contribute. It's also 
helping people become their best. So uh, rather than just being nice as someone who's underperforming, it's finding out why, seeing what's, what's going on within the system. What can, you, what can be uh, done for that individual? They need uh, additional training. They, is there some kind of tool or some kind of uh, uh, change in the process that can help out? Challenge and support people to be their best is, is really the, the key of respecting every individual. Learn continuously. So always acquiring new knowledge. The, the system is constantly changing, no matter what system it is. There's new technology. Uh, think of new weather patterns, new people. people. People are born, people die. People retire, people are hired. Uh, there's always new instruments coming out. There's new procedures. It's about being curious and, and wanting to know what's going on. And the converse of that is not to underestimate the power of unlearning. It's not just adding to the pile, but also recognizing what you knew before that was based on a system that no longer exists because it's changed. So it's a continuous cycle of learning, unlearning, going back and forth. You can kind of I hope you see how these principles are layered on top of each other. The, the being humble and respecting every individual helps support the learning continuously. When you start seeing the different things that are within the system that you can learn from. All right, now we move on to the improvement principles. So we have six of those. They govern, or they govern how performance gets better, gets worse, or stays the same. So the six principles are focus on process, assure quality at the source, flow and pull value, understand and manage variation, embrace scientific thinking, and seek perfection. So the first one is focus on process. So the simple definition of process is a series of steps that produces outputs. It's a unit within, within the system. You can think of a tray moving through uh, SPD from decontamination to wash to assembly to inspection to the sterilizers and then off to uh, wherever it's going, where it's storage or the OR. They're so a pretty well-defined process. So those outputs can be attributed to processes that produce them. So when you have a bad output, start going at the process. Look into the process that produced the output. That way you can see what, what factors were involved. You know, you have factors that can be overcome very often by people making heroic efforts that keep it going all the time. And that one time that that, that doesn't happen, that process that had to be supported by extraordinary efforts then fails. Don't look at the failure, look at the process, go back and see what's happened so that you can fix that. So you don't just fix it the one time, but fix it repeatedly. A short quality at the source. This is another one that, that can be quite popular that you've heard stop the line. When you find a defect, you stop. You don't pass it on, you address it right there and find out what happened. Uh, easy to say, very, very hard to do in real life. When you have production coming and you can't stop because uh, that tray's needed for, for you know, a flip room and it's got to get out, it's hard to say stop the line. We'll set the defect aside, grab a replacement, keep going. And uh, so whatever produced that defect is lost. We may never figure out what produced that defect and it's bound to happen again. It also means don't accept, produce, or pass a defect. If you see one coming, that's another one. Stop it. If you produce a defect, you got to figure out why did we produce a defect. Again, stop the line right there and figure it out. Or pass a defect. If you see a defect come and, and let it go, then uh, it's, the kind of, it's the same thing. They're all interconnected, but it's the idea of when you see defects, being able to right then in real time See what's going on. Again, easier said than done. And uh, that's, that's another thing with the principles is they govern outcomes. So if you, if, you if you want to ignore this one, you can see how it can affect outcomes and negative, or have negative outcomes. Uh, it's, it is a pretty easy one to ignore. So the, more, the better you get with it, the better your system is, is accepting it, the better the outcomes will be. But that's a very hard shift to make. 
So I had a little poll here, but I'm not sure if it's set up that uh, said, you know, do you have audits or secondary inspections in your SPD? So that's just something to think about, because if you have the audits or inspections, you may be catching defects that keep making it through. And uh, I think it's pretty common practice. And generally, when you have a lot of defects caught at audit or inspection, that's when you're not catch or having quality at the source because you're having different aspects of your, your process producing defects. All right, flow and pull value. So pull is the very first thing that happens. Pull is, or, or pull is when the customer defines and asks for value. Uh, that's when the surgery is scheduled and a card pulled. You know that they're going to need a certain instrument. That's when somebody orders a car. The plant knows that they've got to produce that car. So then you flip to flow. How quickly can you flow the value to that customer? Once you know what that customer wants because they said, yes, this is what I want, now we have to flow the value. So there's all kind of roadblocks that, that get in the way of flow. But beginning at a certain point, we can start to recognize those roadblocks, can remove them, and get that flow going. So each step in the process flows to replenish the, down, the, the downstream step. That's another one to think if you've got everything staged, ready to go for a surgery, as soon as that goes in, you have one come back and replace it. That's when you start to get into one piece flow. When it goes out, another one's ready to fill its spot. Upstream of that, another one fills that. Upstream of that, another one fills that. So uh, this is where you see the, the difference between the academic side and the application side. Easy to talk about, hard to do, but at least gives you a point of reference of where you can start. So here's another one. Do you have uh, these in your SPD? Shortages of work at time. One place is slammed where the other one is empty. You have traffic jams where you have places piling up. Or do you have both at the same time uh, where one's empty, one's slammed, and uh, you know, it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of flow. Now, general ebbs and flows throughout the day, you know, in the morning when you have first starts, uh, you're going to see a spike in decon. And uh, you know, that wave kind of flows throughout the SPD. Uh, how do you handle that? That's a, a good question. Uh, no, not an easy answer. But this principle will give you at least an orientation of where to start. Understand and manage variation. So understand the difference between random and assignable cause variation. Uh, random variation exists in every process, and it's hard not to overreact to that. When you see the, the regular ups and downs, uh, it's, it's fun to get excited when it's up and you know, sad when it's down. But random variation uh, is something that happens in every process, and learning to accept it is a, is a healthy thing so you don't over-involve yourself in changing the process. However, then being able to pick out uh, assignable uh, variation is very important. That's when something's happening in the process that's causing instability. So there's all different kinds of statistical models and tools, and that's, that's another discussion for another day. But uh, understanding the difference is key to understanding the performance of the process. Embrace scientific thinking. If you've heard of PDCA or have done PDCA, that's the scientific method, and uh, that's the plan, do, check, and act. Make a plan. You, you devise an experiment. You go and perform the experiment. Check the results. You study them. Did, did you get what you expected? If you did, great. You act on it and spread it. And if you don't, then you go back and do the cycle again. The cycle never ends. You keep doing it because the, the improvement has to be continuous. The best way to do is small, reversible experiments to understand how change affects the system. Very hard to do because everyone wants to do big, grand changes, big things that will revolutionize the system. But rather, if you can have rapid cycles of small, rever reversible experiments, because not every experiment is going to work. If it did, it wouldn't be an experiment. So think about that when you're doing PDCA. Keep it small. Focus on little things that can change and make a difference on the outcome. See how they make the outcome and try to view it unbiasedly. And seek perfection. So that doesn't mean being perfect. It is not demand perfection or expect perfection. That's unrealistic. It's easy to do that. It's easy to think we want to be perfect. We want to have zero defects. We want to have 
zero delays. We're going to have 100% on time starts. That's, that's great orientation. That's where we want to get. So anything that keeps us from that, let's address it. But a system is dynamic and always changing. So the best way isn't always the way that it was in the past. So keep that in mind. That's the same. It goes hand in hand with learning continuously. As a system changes, the way that you have to adjust and the way you handle your processes have to change with it. If your, if your processes are stagnant, then as the system changes, the process will no longer match what you need and the outcomes uh, won't be what you want. So there's always be uh, opportunities for improvement. All right, so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, at the beginning, I said, you know, as we're a recovering handyman, and in the sense that is, a lot of people look at lean as being tool-based. You think of 5S, huddle boards, value stream maps, um, and they're all great tools. But without understanding principles and how they apply to systems, you can be using a tool in the wrong way. Uh, thinking back to my career, if I had you know, great tools at the railroad, even physical tools, you know, hammers, huge wrenches. We had different ways to schedule, you know, trains in and out. Uh, our locomotive shops had, uh, you know, scheduling uh, boards, but we couldn't apply those the same way in healthcare. I couldn't bring my sledgehammer in to the OR; it just wouldn't work. Same way with healthcare, I can't take, uh, you know, rangers out to a lazy river and go put in what I do now. Uh, so those tools are very specialized. Think of those; the lean tools are the same way. They've got to be specialized to your location. A 5S in uh, one location, one hospital may be different than another. The one thing that unites them all is the principles. So it can be you know, a bit abstract, you know, a bit, bit uh, academic. If you think about those before you engage in, in the process improvement, before you engage in developing your tools and then executing them, uh, I really think it will help orient you in getting the results you want. So uh, I really appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully we have some questions or, or some discussion. Yeah, thanks for that presentation. Um, yeah, really interesting description of principles. I like that comparison to gravity and uh, just making that connection there. And certainly a ton of application to sterile processing. A uh, couple of questions. Um, that would be good to talk about here at the end of it. You mentioned um, looking at defects and being willing not to pass along any defects and ask the rhetorical question, do you have any second checks, any audits in your sterile processing department? And I would be curious to hear a little bit more from you, like what you see a comfortable spot being for the amount of double checking and audits that should take place in a sterile processing department. Oh, that's uh that's a tough one because every every de department's different. Uh, um, you may have uh, uh, older instruments, bad water uh, that, that hides a lot of defects within tools, and uh, they may pass by the the first inspection. You may need to have more uh, more audits in in that. You know, in the ideal world, everybody would catch every defect the first time, and, and we know that's not realistic. Right. So. Uh, you know, I think you look at look at the data, look at your 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 rates, your defect rates, where you're having them, and uh, try and get as close as you can to uh, where you think it's happening. But uh, I don't think it's a universal answer because every system it will be a little different. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a question here. Um, you know, so we look at the world of healthcare today, right, and it's challenging. Um, for in more ways than one and sterile processing departments are facing a lot of labor shortages across the country and you talked about principles um, so how would you improve departmental pr principles or maintain principles when these healthcare facilities are dealing with employee shortages and turnover and are there ways to maintain the process flow when you're shorthanded you know like if you don't have somebody to assemble a tray or, you know, those those breaks in the system, uh, if, you know, if you have any insight on or suggestions on how departments that are shorthanded could go about doing that. Oh, that's that's a great question. Uh, 
it's probably a, a little closer to the front lines than than uh, you know, a, a principal will get you. But I think you know if, if you look at, at some of them like learning uh, learning continuously. Uh, if, if you're looking at your system and and let's say you're you're, you're in some way responsible for for training or staffing. Um, you can look at what skills are needed at what spot, where what's in most um, most demand or you know, most deficit. Uh, you can, I guess, really look at at the training system you have, and uh, yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one because let me try and think about that. Yeah, I'd like I think to give a, an answer that actually makes sense. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I'm getting a little right. too too academic. I mean, I'm thinking about tools like you know, if you have a training timetable, which is you know a a, a tool used in in uh, you know, job training, you can look at at where you can have people backing up other people and get there. But uh, the reality is, you know, job shortages are are all over right now, and it's it's a very hard thing to deal with. Where it's very tempting to just throw people in a thing that they're not prepared to do. That's uh, also goes to respect the individual. If you expect someone to do something that they're not prepared to do, not trained to do, that they don't know how to do, um, you're going to get poor outcomes. So I guess maybe one of the downsides of, uh, you know, the study of principles is, you know, they govern the outcomes, but it doesn't always give you the answer. It just gives you a premise on which to think about the answer. Right. Yeah. And, and Probably and not the answer people wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I think... You know, you make a good point, though. It, it really does go back to processes, you know, and Bobby knows this working in the sterile processing departments. If you have uh, real defined processes and ways of, you know, going through the steps, you can find ways to, you know, bridge those gaps, so to speak, if the process is right. If there's a break in the process, that's where you uh, that's where the challenge begins especially when you're shorthanded so um you know i think that's a tough question it's uh <laughs> it's not an easy answer but um uh thanks for thanks for your your insight yeah we've got another a uh, another scenario here that i want to pitch your way um one of our listeners said that they're having an issue with scopes uh, being broken and being in need of repair, but their process hasn't changed, their staff hasn't changed. Um, what lean tools or principles would you use to help figure out why this is happening? What direction can you point them? Well, I, I would start with the value stream map. And uh, uh, if anyone's done that out there, sometimes you think of big, huge five-day events or, or two-week events to do that. But uh, really, when you think of a value stream map, it can be as simple as, uh, you know, OR, to, you know, the back table, down to decontam, over to the washer, over here. So you can sit, figure out what the process is. So you know where in that process you're finding it broken. Then you start going backwards and finding, you know, when was the last time it, it was good, if, if you have that kind of traceability. Uh, maybe you don't have that traceability or, or that kind of, uh, you know, insight. But start focusing on the process, start looking back. Uh, Value Stream Map is a great tool for, for the principal focus on the process. And you can see what's happening at each stage that may affect that instrument, whether it's a scope or, or really anything. Uh, you know, is it being uh, washed the right way? Is it, is it being you know, thrown a big bird's nest and, uh, from the, on the back table and being sent down? Uh, is it being used improperly in the OR? You know, it can be anything along that line. But uh, if, you, if you focus on the process and start going backwards, uh, you can see how it's being treated and, and maybe where that defect is, uh, is occurring. Yeah, that's really helpful. And with uh, delicate scopes in particular, I know that can be a bit mystifying <laughs> trying to figure out mm -hmm. where, the, uh, where the issues are coming from. And just speaking from my experience, the more data that you can collect at all of those different touch points the easier it becomes. So I'm not sure of your particular situation, but I would encourage you to try to implement some data points, both in the OR and in sterile processing about who's handling the scope and figuring out at what point it's, um, it, it's first discovered as damaged. If 
if the only check for integrity of scope we have is on the clean side and sterile processing. It could have happened in transport, in the OR, in decontamination, any of those places. And so um, really doing a, a team-centered uh, approach with the OR, collecting all of that data, and, um, and like was mentioned, going backwards and trying to find the the trends can help and and also you know utilizing uh your repair vendor to to help you identify that as well maybe they'd be able to identify certain types of damage that um that look like handling issues or look like uh, interoperative issues um all, all all those could could help you narrow that down a bit and one thing i'd like to add too is um a, a, a training program that was put into place where you know, it focused on you know different key points where defects were. So instead of just being uh, you know, like, like you said, the clean side inspection, it turned out we were getting upstream inspections, maybe not as throws as it would be there. But uh, when you looked at instruments that would have bio burden in certain areas or, uh, or rust or, or something broken, uh, even in decontam because you, they're trying to scrub a little bit better that was a, like a key place to look uh we found that we were catching defects much farther upstream closer to when they were occurring and uh so that's something also just uh to not not, not underestimate how training can help uh you know identify where those defects are happening and get a little closer yeah no doubt yeah, I think that that's a great point. I mean, you know, I've I we often talk about the aspect of team, right? And and the difficulties in, you know, bringing the teams together throughout the departments, whether it's, you know, I think sterile processing, the OR, infection prevention, you know, it, regardless of where you are in the hospital, you really need to have an understanding of who does what and you have to have an, an appreciation of that and um, then it goes back to that process if you know who's working together if you have an understanding of of what's being done in the departments uh, if you're spending time in spd or spd is spending time in the or you can really get a feel of where some of those bottlenecks are and where some of those issues are and it, if you're working together you can really um, refine those processes from top to bottom. So, yep, some good insight there for sure. Yeah, well, we wanna take a, just another opportunity, Jeff, to say thanks for coming on here and giving this awesome presentation um, for your expertise in Lean and some actionable takeaways. Uh, if any of you all have some questions for Jeff that you didn't get the opportunity to ask or you think of them later, feel free to contact Jeff via email or LinkedIn. Uh, you'll find both of those options in the speaker bio tool on the right side of your screen. So check that out and, and save that data. Uh, so Jeff, thanks for coming on. You did a great job in your presentation. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Now, as our day comes to a close, everyone, I want to again thank you for um, for attending this conference, and I want to thank today's premier event sponsor, OneTray IST. Without their support, this exciting day of virtual learning wouldn't have would not have been possible. And uh, thank you for our industry experts for joining us for this virtual event. I also want to recognize all the professionals out there who are reprocessing surgical instruments across the globe. For all of you who chose to spend the day educating yourself, we'd like to thank you for your dedication to the professional development of yourself and for best practices. Now, as we've mentioned a couple of times at this session's close, you're going to be directed to the conference survey page where you'll have access to the survey. And from there, you can download your CE certificate all of today's sessions are available on demand uh, and feel free to rewatch, share and continue to access those downloadable resources that have been provided to you. So stay safe out there, sterile processing. And as always, keep fighting dirty. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Happy Halloween. <laughs>